any better? I think we're doing good. How is everybody this evening? Happy 4th of July! It was on this day in 1776 in Philadelphia that Congress approved and authorized that document, our Declaration of Independence. Now, contrary to popular belief, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we read the document, contrary to popular belief, on that day, only one person signed the document. Does anybody know who that might be? John Hancock. He approved it as the president of Congress. We actually declared our independence on what day? July 2nd of 1776. Very good. You know, we speak about the American Revolution. I have spoken about the American Revolution. But am I a revolutionary? Am I? As Governor Dunmore says, am I a rebel for what I do? I'm seeing several people yell, yes, I do not consider myself a rebel. I consider myself a man who is standing up to defend my country. A rebel goes against the government. A rebel fights not necessarily for what is good, but just fights to be contrary to set up something different. There was a reason that we did what we did during the American Revolution. And I don't think I want to be labeled as a rebel or as a revolutionary. Let me explain this. Back when I argued the case for the Parsons cause, back in 17 and 63, I was a young lawyer, and I saw injustice being done. And I spoke out not only against the ministers of the time, of which my uncle was an Anglican minister, but I spoke out against the crown for usurping his authority to bypass the legislature. In 1765, in a time when Thomas Jefferson points back and says that this gave first impulse to the ball of the American Revolution, I was speaking out against the Stamp Act. Was I a rebel for speaking out against the Stamp Act? Was I a rebel for speaking out against a law that was illegal? Sir, if I come to you and I threaten you, you have a right to defend yourself. Is that correct? Do I call you a rebel? No. Not at all. He's defending himself. And that's what I was doing. The Stamp Act was an illegal act. It was an illegal tax. Parliament had no authority to tax the colonies. That was the moment that Jefferson points to giving first impulse to the ball of the American Revolution. Was I a rebel in March of 17? In 75, when I finally felt that things had become bad enough, that it was time for Virginia to arm herself in defense of Great Britain. I don't believe so. Yes, there was a revolution. Yes, we did wish ultimately to split from Great Britain. But we held out hope as long as we could. And then it was time for us to defend ourselves. On March 
23rd of 1775, just a mere weeks after I had lost my dear wife, Sarah, to a debilitating illness. I went to Richmond as a delegate to the Second Virginia Convention. I knew what had to be done, and I feel others knew what had to be done as well. On the fourth day of that convention, no one else having spoken up, I felt it was time. And I issued resolutions calling for Virginia to create a militia made up of average citizens, shopkeepers, farmers, ministers, anybody who was willing to take up arms for liberty. Much argument ensued back and forth in regards to these resolutions. Naturally, people were afraid. For I was speaking about the potential of going to war against Great Britain, one of the most elite military forces in all of the world. And as I mentioned, I was suggesting that we approach them or we defend ourselves with untrained, undisciplined soldiers. I felt we could win. I rose and I defended my resolutions. Let's see if I can remember how this went. I addressed the president of the convention, Mr. Peyton Randolph. Mr. President, no man thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism as well as the abilities of the very worthy gentlemen that have just addressed this house. But different men often see the same subject in different light. And therefore, I hope it will not be thought of as disrespectful to these gentlemen. If entertaining as I do, a character very opposite to theirs, I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before this house is one of awful moment to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. And in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at the truth fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and to our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time for fear of giving offense, I should consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country and guilty of an act of disloyalty against the majesty of heaven which I revere above all earthly kings. Now, Mr. President, it is natural for man to indulge the illusion of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes to the painful truths and listen to the song of the siren. Listening to that song and she'll sh until she turns us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be among those who having eyes see not? Or having ears hear not the things which so nearly concern our temporal salvation? For my own part, Whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth. I'm willing to know the worst and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, 
and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no other way of judging the future but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for these last 10 years, which justifies the hopes with which these gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and this house. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. It shall prove to be a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed by a kiss. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with the warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. <coughs> Tell me, are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Tell me, have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves. These are implements of war and subjugation. These are the last arguments to which a king resorts. I ask, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us into submission. Can gentlemen assign any other possible motives for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir. She has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. <laughs> They are sent over to bind and to rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been for so long forging. And what have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument? We have been trying that for the last 10 years. Have we anything new to offer on that subject? Nothing. We have held this subject up in every light that it is capable, but it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty or humble supplication? What terms shall we find which have not been already exhausted? Let us not. I beseech you, let us not deceive ourselves any longer. We have done everything that could be done to avert this storm which is now coming on. We have petitioned. We have remonstrated. We have supplicated. We have prostrated ourselves before the throne and implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded. We have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne. In vain after these things may we indulge the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve unviolated these inestimable privileges for which we have been for so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle that we have been for so long engaged in and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest has been obtained, we must fight. I repeat that. We must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left us. They tell us that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we
we be stronger? Will it be next month, next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and a British guard is stationed at every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance while lying supinely on our backs while hugging that delusive phantom of hope? Until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot. Sir, we are not weak if we make proper use of the means which the God of nature has placed in our powers. Three millions of men armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a nation as that which, as that which we possess these men are invincible against any force the enemy shall send against us besides sir there is a just god who presides over the destinies of the nations and he will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. We must remember, the battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It's to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking can be heard upon the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable. And let it come. I repeat that. Let it come. It is in vain to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace. But there is no peace. The war has actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from our north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren, our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it the gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear? Is peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. For I know not what course others may take. But as for me, give me liberty! Or give me death. I can only wish that the delegates responded the same way. <laughs> the resolutions for arming Virginia did indeed pass, and a committee was formed. Not just a few weeks later, at Lexington, in Concord, in Massachusetts, shots were fired. Because the government had come in under the order of the governor, of the royal governor of Massachusetts, to capture the arms from the people of Massachusetts. 
Seems to be a popular story. Within a few days, the same thing happened here in Virginia. No shots were fired, but under the orders of Governor Dunmore, the gunpowder in Williamsburg was stolen and taken upon a royal ship. I gathered men and I marched on Williamsburg in order to demand the return of the gunpowder or payment for the gunpowder. I was ultimately met by a representative of the government of the governor with the promise to pay for the powder. And it was as a result of that that he issued the resolutions which I scrapped a few moments ago where he referred to my delusional followers and my rebellious actions. So once again, I pose the question to you. Was I rebellious because I was defending my nation? I don't believe I was. I believe I was somebody who was doing what was right. Now let me leave you with these words as we celebrate our independence this year. When we refer to American independence, whether it becomes a blessing or a curse depends upon each and every one of us. It depends upon the use that each and every one of us place upon the gracious gifts, the gracious blessings that God has bestowed upon us. If we are wise, we will be great and happy. But if we are of a contrary character, we will be miserable. Righteousness alone will exalt us as a nation. I want to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for making Red Hill a part of your Independence Day celebration. As was mentioned, I'll be available to meet folks afterwards. And then a little bit later, we'll talk a little bit about the Declaration of Independence and we'll read the document itself.